So every now and then we get somebody sends us a nice little snack from the garden and I got something here. Um, came from Mark. Mark? Yeah. I think his name was Mark. Matt. 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 Matt That's King. Matt. Matt King. Sorry, Matt. Matt's right from up around Athens. Up there around God's country. Oh, yeah. In Athens. Anyway, we got some uh, apricot habanero pepper jelly and some apricot ghost pepper jelly. Ghost pepper jelly? Yeah. So we, uh, I got us a little board here. I ain't eating lunch. Yeah, we're going to. Well, now I'm going to tell you that I love habanero pepper jelly and it's I, I'm not a big fan of hot things, but habanero has got a f great flavor to me. One of my buddies is ex-wife. He run her off, or she left. Anyhow, she's gone. He used to make the best habanero jelly I've ever eaten. Oh, really? It's my favorite. And pepper jellies, habanero is my favorite. Now this ghost pepper here thing could go bad in a hurry. It could. It could. It could go bad in a hurry. That's why I, I made sure we got plenty of. Uh, might get tangled up my mic cord down here. I got plenty of uh other, it is pretty though. other goodies down here. Yeah. Just in case this stuff here was to light us up. I got your own little spatula right there. Mm -mm. So we got some um well, we got some salami, some capicola, and some prosciutto right there. Uh, got some fancy whole wheat rich crackers. Uh, right here we got some Manchego, aged Manchego cheese. Here we got some local uh, Thomasville Tom from Sweetgrass. Oh. So, however you want to do this, I'm going to come in here with a little bit. I'm going to go with the habanero. Yeah, pepper. that's what I was thinking. Yeah, let's just uh, warm it up a little bit. Yeah, let's, let's just be. But easy. you know, habanero, if you, the heat, if you can get past the heat, it's got a, a good flavor. great flavor to it. I mean, I just. I love that flavor. Just start out here. Mm. Little cheese, put some Tom on there. I didn't bring any napkins. Did you? No, you wipe it on your britches like I do. So it's that fall. It's that time of the year. It is. It's the time of the year, and um, SC, I know this is a gardening show, but SEC football just started back. Really? Saturday. Mm-hmm. And. Uh, a lot of our viewers live in the South. I'm sure we're excited about that. Our defending national championships, the, the LSU Tigers, they kind of slipped up on the first game. Yeah. And um, yeah. So, a little background here. You may not know this. So, there's a coach named Mike Leach who used to um, help out at Kentucky. He's been in the Pacific Northwest for a while, but he helped create this offense back in the day called the Air Raid Offense, where they throw the ball a ton. And uh, he created this kind of system under a coach named Hal Mummy. Now, Hal <laughs> Mummy used to coach at Valdosta State. I remember him. Okay. So Hal Mummy used to coach at Valdosta State, then he got a job at Kentucky, yep. where he worked with Mike Leach there. Uh, so LSU played Mississippi State, and I've known over the years quite a few people that went to Mississippi State. And Not really impressed with none of them, were you? <laughs> <laughs> They're right. They're right. Um, and I also had a buddy in college when I was in Athens. One of my roommates, he left to go to Washington State to go to PhD school up there, and that's where Mike Leach was the coach. So anyway, a lot of lot of kind of interesting uh, networks there. But LSU, they wasn't kind of expecting old Mike Leach to come in there and and throw the ball around like he tends to do. And um, something happened. They end up. Ooh, what happened? They end up getting beat. And you know they had a they had a great team last year. Beat Alabama like they did. Ooh. Yeah. So I made a little uh, chart here to kind of explain to everybody what and why it happened here. Mm. And I made this real simple for our Alabama folks out there that that aren't the best at math. The folks went to Tuscaloosa and Auburn. So I made this real simple here. So we got um, LSU. Minus Joe equals. Hmm. That's that's what LSU is right now. Minus one. O and one. Hmm. So for everybody out there, y'all can kind of keep that in your back pocket. That is what has happened to LSU. I feel bad for them. I do too. But, uh, I feel like they're gonna they're gonna rebound. You know, some pie that needs back. a little humbling every now and then. That's right. And they got them a little humble pie. That's right. You can't win them all. Can't win them all. Are you ready to try this ghost pepper? Well, I, I, I'm going to wait just a minute let you go ahead with it. You know, we got the greenhouse about full of fall plantings. 
I'm not got too much. And we got a lot of stuff growing. We got man, I, my kale's up doing good. Cabbage is doing great. Onions, onions good. going doing good. Broccoli, kohlrabi. We got a little bit of everything. And the guy asked me the other day that was new to garden. He was concerned about fertilizing. And I went out and looked yesterday, and I got those those second leaves, those true leaves coming on pretty good. I got thinking. I fertilized them twice. So you really can't get lazy or can't get complacent when those when those first two leaves pop out there and you start seeing those true leaves down there, you need to be getting ready to put some fertilizer on them. You can't wait a few days and hope and wish and carry on. You need to really pump these greens along. People don't understand, they take a lot of nitrogen. Mm -hmm. Not as much as corn. We know corn's a real heavy feeder, but greens, cabbage, and things like that are real close to needing the same or close to needing as much fertilizer nitrogen as corn is which is a lot i had someone ask me the other day they were wondering could you use fish emulsion to fertilize your seedlings versus inorganic something like 20 20 20 and i was explaining to them you can put all the fish emulsion you want to on there it's not going to hurt anything the problem is those seedlings got to have it fast and they don't really you don't really have time for the fish emulsion to break down in the soil uh so that's why we use inorganic fertilizer right. it's not bad it's not bad. It's got a little heat to it, but it ain't. Yeah, it ain't bad. It's actually pretty good. Um, so that's why we use the 20, 20, 20, and and you get it to them fast. It's already converted over into inorganic form. But uh, those those onions we planted, those plethora of onions we planted on the show, are looking really, really good. And those, those things are growing fast. They are, which is good because we was a little behind the eight ball on plant modes. Yeah. Uh, I think he's I think he's still got plenty of time. I planted last year. I planted some onions uh, in October, and they still came off fast. Some of these hybrid varieties they come off oh, yeah. real fast. Yep. Speaking of onions, we've been adding a lot of new onions. I kind of went all in on the onions, and I got a variety I've been waiting on, and I just got them in. And this is a new one here, and this one is called Sweet Agent. And um, I think I mentioned this on the show. A little warm. So that's good. Uh, I think I mentioned this on the show a few weeks ago, but there's an article out there. It's not too hard to find where the University of Georgia did a study of all these uh, Vidalia approved varieties. And they looked at things like um, straight biomass of the yield, different things like that. They looked at how many coals they had, what was the percentage of, you know, sellable harvest. And a lot of the varieties we carry were at the top of that list in that study and one of the ones that did really good one of the ones that made the biggest onion was this here called a sweet agent sweet agent and um you remember them people that brought by that massive yes onion? i do i don't know for sure but if i had to guess i would say it may have been a sweet that agent. was what we classify as a colossal colossal and so this is a nice you know granite. I'm, I'm looking forward to just having there after that yeah nice flat granite onion yeah um sweet onion and I, I can't say this for sure because, it, you know, growing it in Athens may be a little bit different than growing it down here, but some of the studies I've seen suggest that this would make the biggest onion of the varieties we have. Now, it would be a close race. Savannah Sweet makes a big old onion. We've got several. So, refer to that, we have several Vidalia-approved varieties on our site. Some people really like that type of onion. Um, so let me go through these Vidalia approved varieties we have. We got the Sweet Agent. We got the Plethora. Mm -hmm. We got the Savannah Sweet. That's Danny and Juan at Deep South. They grew this one last year. They, they love it. And then we've got the Sweet Harvest here. Now I will tell you this, folks. You ain't going to find these onion varieties nowhere else online but Hoss Tools. That's right. And if you go, if you try to go the route of going to buy onion plants, you ain't gonna find these varieties here. So if you wanna grow these real awesome varieties, they're gonna make massive onions. You're gonna have to grow them from seed. You're gonna have to get them from us. So there that is. What else we got going on? Well, we got lots going on. We got our new building going up. Uh, Lot of us busy around here. I'm gonna go in with some Our new building's going pepper. up. You done on the ghost pepper? Well, no, I'm gonna go back. I just I'm gonna digest that. Hand me that right over here while you're doing. And we got something in this week we've been waiting on for a long, Can long time. It? I can. And that is these babies right here. These new fertilizer injectors. We got them in a day or so ago, and we got them on the site. 
I had a couple of people email me complaining about the cost of them. They said they went up. So I attempted to explain to them the reason why, and I'm going to go over it again right now. So we made some huge improvements to this. And uh, we talked to the manufacturer, and we told them what our concerns was. We went back and forth, had a good line of communication. And we wanted to specify that the tank be a lot thicker, a lot better tank, a constant pressure tank, where the older injectors we had were not constant pressure. Now, to be clear, on the older tanks, it's got a big sticker on the back, and it says in instructions, don't leave it under constant pressure. Right, right. But some of us men... A hard like to read instructions and hard hit. Right. So if you left it under constant pressure, the old tank, which was made out of material called HDPE, it would burst at the seam. This one here doesn't have any seams. It's made out of PVC, a thick PVC, mm -hmm. and it won't bust if you were to take it and drop it from a high elevation onto some concrete. On up bar. While it was pressurized, you might could bust it, but you're not gonna. Uh, bust that guy. Also, we made a big change here that this hose bill connector, which is where you hook your water hoses into, used to be made out of PVC and we changed that and went to brass, which is a lot more durable. However, it did cost more. We looked at these things here and we said, you know what, we'd like to have that. It's going to add a little bit of cost to it, but not a lot. So we made these changes. Of course, we branded ours, the Hoss Tools. We got a nice little pretty label on it. And we're going to have these things in stock, I hope, for the next little while. I think we got 300 in. 600. We got 600 in. So these will last for a little while. We'll run out probably before we get some more in the way things have been going. So if you're interested in one of these, I would highly recommend this baby right here. It is a one gallon. Uh, the ones we sold before were three quarter gallon and two gallon. Don't let that bother you a whole lot. I'll be honest with you. I always use the three quarter gallon one anyway. So the, yeah, for any of my plots, it's 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 just efficient. easy. This one gallon is easy to pick up and tote around. It's just a real nice ejector, and I think once you see what you're getting here, you'll be you know proud you, proud you bought it and impressed with the quality of it. Let me go over something real quick, like so. Uh, we do have a replacement parts kit on the side if you got an old one and you want this brass piece, and you maybe. These hoses, I will say, after a few years, if you leave it sitting out in the sun, it, it does help to replace them. Can you unscrew that lid? Well, heck yeah. And I kind of seen this coming because I know some people were going to ask. They were going to say, I've got this old system, but I want that new tank. Can I adapt it? Uh-huh. And you sure can. So the lid is exactly the same. Yeah. These hoses are exactly the same. They are shorter, though. I'm going back with the ghost pepper. Going back with the ghost pepper. So on the side, if you scroll down the bottom where replacement parts are, we've got a replacement parts kit for the injector, which has everything you need. We've even got, if you lose your flow disc, we've got those on the site now. We've got just the tanks themselves. So Ooh. if you got one of the old tanks, want to go to the new one, you can get just the tank. The only thing you have to do is come in here on your old lid, assuming your lid is still good, take and trim up these two hoses here. So pull them off there, trim them up. You don't want them, you know, jamming in there. You want them to go right almost to where they touch the bottom of the tank. So you can retrofit the old two gallon or three quarter gallon model to this new system with the parts we have on the site. Here you go. And as far as feeding those heavy feeding brassicas in the fall, your cabbage, your collards, your cauliflower, your broccoli, all that good stuff, that's going to do the trick right there. Mm -hmm. You can put uh, you can put calcium nitrate in it, you can put 20-20-20 in it, microboost, anything that's water soluble. Now I do recommend that you use a backflow preventer when you use one of these. These things are on our site. You can add that black food preventer. How much that thing costs? It's what, 10 or 12 bucks? Something like no, that. I don't think it's that much. But, but you can do an add on when you buy this right here. And what that back flow preventer does, it prevents anything from siphoning back into the water supply. So if you're on your own well and you're using this right here and you got the fertilizer, if the power was to go off, there is a chance that it could siphon whatever's in this line here back into your well. And that back flow preventer prevents that from happening. It stops the flow from pulling back through the water lines. So it's a good insurance policy. Things don't cost very much. 
and I'd recommend using one of those. Now, with this right here, there's another application you could use this for if you wanted to. You people out there that love your pretty yards and like to, you know, put a sprinkler system out there and water your yards, you could put this 20, 20, 20 in there with this setup right here and run fertilizer through your sprinkler system. Another way to use it, now we always talk about using it with the drip system. Another way to use it is to use that with some of our liquid fish or our fish and guano before or during uh, the time when you're growing a cover crop and you're doing a little soil rehabilitation. You can feed it. I've done this with my tripod sprinkler. I'll run some, uh, and with that tripod sprinkler, it runs through pretty quick. I run some fish emulsion through there or some liquid fish through there. <coughs> feed that soil and then you got the cover crop coming in there so you got all those microbes and uh, just doing some good good stuff for your soil yep. so you don't have to use it with a drip system works great with a drip system but even if you've just got a, on your patio you just hand watering some stuff and want to shoot a little fertilizer to them you can use them yeah i'm getting a little out there here but i'm going to say this here you could also use this with a wetting agent in there, if it was if you went through a real dry period and your soils got real dried out and was having a hard time taking the water in, you could also put a wetting agent through this and run through your irrigation system. And that would help your lawn out a lot. Now, we're not lawn guys; we're garden guys. So I was, I was mixing it up a little bit there, getting into the ornamental Chasing part. Around. Yeah, Chasing I was get, getting back in my old old days. Multitude of problems. If you love a pretty yard or you want to grow multitude a good garden. Of not problems, multitude of applications. Of opportunities. Opportunities. So okay. if you want to uh, run fertilizer through your irrigation system, it's a must have. All right, a few more things. Uh, like the ghost pepper is making me hallucinate. Uh oh. Uh oh. A few more things we just got back on the site that I know a lot of people have been waiting for. Our famous owl squash that you grew. And uh, I'll let you talk about this a little bit, but we have gotten those germ tested. We got them on the site now. We got them in packets. Uh, they're under the winter squash. We'll put a link below in the description for the YouTube version of the show. Uh, but we got them on the site so you can get your owl squash seed. We probably will run out of these as we do some more. Of these oh, yeah, these, these, are, rare these are products. limited supply. Let me have that pack there a minute. All right, folks, this is a, a squash I grew this year that I was really impressed with. I believe it's in the Peppo family, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Grew off real short, uh, 100 days at most. I, 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 it didn't take more than 100 days for them to make. Um, real good, it ate well, high sugar content. Now here's the deal, 79% germination. I was hoping the germination would be a little higher than that, but it come back to 70, excuse me. 79%, that means for every 10 seeds you plant, 7.9 of them is going to germinate. So you want to plant these a little thick, get you a few extra ones to go along with it, because 79 is what it is. All right, now we sell seeds, and I'm, we don't speak a lot about saving seeds and that kind of thing, but if you buy these owl squash or these Cherokee tans, which we got back on the Which side. are extremely anyway. rare, I would highly recommend you to save your seeds. It don't take you a long time to do that when you start. Squash is the easiest thing to save. Yeah, save your seeds, and the reason I say that is these things are extremely rare. There's only two people that I know of in the United States growing this squash, me being one of them. So, I mean, if I had a crop failure or somebody else had a crop failure, these things would be lost. Right. So save your seeds, share them with some family, and I think you'll be, you know, I think you'll be impressed. But it, it's a great one, but we need to bring it back out, and we'd like to have other people in other regions saving the seeds. Same thing with that Cherokee tan. It's not a lot, not a lot of people growing them, so uh, it's one we need to keep. I was doing some research on that, uh, and so that was a re this originated in New England, uh, grown by the. Abin I don't know if it's Abenaki or Abenaki, uh, Native American tribe up in New England. Um, so that's a great little kind of heritage seed there. And the Cherokee tan as well. Like I said, we got those back on the site. Both of those, I'm sure at some point uh, in the next few months, we will run out of. But uh, Yeah, we'll, if, you, if you want some of them, get them pretty quick because I'm pretty sure by January we'll be out of them. One more thing. Um, well, so you was chasing rabbits, so I'm going to chase a rabbit real quick. So this had nothing to do with gardening, but me and my wife and my kids. My, me, my wife, and myself and I. Whatever. Um, have started a YouTube channel uh, called Pop-Up Life. And it's all it's just a family YouTube channel showing our adventures as we go pop-up camping all around the southeast. Now, we've only got like three videos up so far. But... 
And, and if you don't, you know, if this just doesn't suit your fancy, that's fine. But I would really appreciate it if our loyal viewers would head on over there. And we'll put a link below in the YouTube description. If you guys will head on there and just give me a little courtesy subscribe. If you like the videos, watch them, you know, enjoy them. But if y'all could give me a little uh, courtesy subscribe there, I sure would appreciate it. Those first thousand subscribers are the hardest ones to get. We usually have anywhere from eight to 10,000 people watching this show every week. And if we could just get, you know, uh, a tenth or a fifth of those people to just go over there and hit that subscribe button on the Pop Up Life channel, I would surely appreciate it. Let's talk about cover crops. That's what Let's we're talking about. Cover crops. So, uh, last week, when me and Jason were on the show, did you get to watch that? I watched some of it. Um, how'd you think he, he did filling in for I you? I thought he did pretty good. Now, he's not near as good looking as I am. Yeah. But he did okay. Yeah. Can't have it all, can Can't you? have it all. So, last week, we promised that we would do a show on cool season cover crops. And we got a lot of them we just added to the site. I'm going back ghosting. I'm going back ghosting. Well, I'm I think we need heap, to uh, on there. put some more in there. We didn't get as many peppers in I'll there. Tell you what, that's good stuff right there. It is good stuff. Uh, so we promised we'd do a show on cool season cover crops. We just added a bunch more to the site. A lot of them are already kind of flying. And uh, some of these new ones might, people might not be as familiar with. And I wanted to kind of go through and explain. The, the biggest question we always get is, which cover crop should I plant? And there's really not a wrong answer to that for the most part. And so, you know, if you've never grown a cover crop, just pick one. And then if you don't like that one, pick another one the following year. You really can't go wrong with some of these. There are some subtle differences in the ability to turn them in or terminate them. Well, they're all going to benefit your soil in one way or the other. And, and which one you grow just really has to do with what you're looking for. You're looking... Uh, for weed suppression, you're looking for nitrogen addition, you're looking for uh, biofumigation. And we've got a nice chart on our site that gives you the pluses. It's got a kind of a little <coughs> pie um, chart thing for, for every category of things that cover crops could do for everyone. And that's really helpful to kind of give you an idea of what you may like. Let's cover crops have got, they serve a purpose, they're there for a reason. So we use cover crops to do something for us. It's kind of all about us with cover crops. We don't put a cover crop out there because they're pretty. Cover crops are going to have to do something for us, and we want to do minimum inputs with cover crops. Besides buying the seeds in a little time, putting them out there, there's not a lot of cost to them. It's very economical, or it doesn't cost much to do it. And it, for the bang for the buck, it's huge. I normally don't put much, if any, fertilizer on cover crops. I kind of, they kind of have to fend for themselves because what? It's all about me with cover crops. Let's talk about some of the benefits of cover crops. There's lots of them out there, and there's a lot of good stuff online about cover crops. So there's a website, I think it's called SARE, S-A-R-E. Mm -hmm. I can't remember what that stands for. Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education. It's a nonprofit, I believe. Anyway, they have worlds of information on cover crops, the benefits, all that good stuff. Good website to check out in your spare time. So some of the benefits, nitrogen fixation, especially with your cool season cover crops. You don't get that as much with the exception of sun hemp with your, and, and peas, iron clay peas. You don't get that as much with the warm season cover crops, but a lot of these cool season cover crops are nitrogen fixers. Mm -hmm. Yep. Another thing too, we know corn is a heavy feeder. So if you planted sweet corn out there and you're thinking about which cover crop you want to follow up with that corn, you want one that does a good job of scavenging the nutrients. And there's several of them out there that does that. They will get down there and start growing and all those nutrients that you had left over from growing that corn will adhere or will you know go to that cover crop and hold it for you so that you need it again. Right. So that that's another good the benefit cycle. of cover crops yep. is what we call soil building. Soil building entails several different things. You're adding organic matter from the biomass of the cover crop. Um, you're reducing compaction via what I call tickling. Those deep roots of the cover crops kind of tickle the soil. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go with some mustard uh, this time. Compaction and, and, and help you from having that hard pan. The other thing, like you mentioned, is the scavenging of nutrients. And this may be a foreign concept to some people, but a lot of these cover crops have really, really deep roots. 
deeper than your vegetable crops are going to have. And what they do is those roots go down there and they pull up these nutrients from way down deep that otherwise wouldn't be accessible to the vegetable hidden. plant. They hiding down in there and they're bringing them back up and yeah. showing their face. And then when you cut them down and turn them in the soil, you've got all these new nutrients that were what too deep to access before, but now you brought them to the surface. And they're available, readily available to that plant that you're trying, trying to grow now. Boom, boom, ready. Boom, boom. The other thing is erosion control. That one's, that one's pretty intuitive, pretty obvious. You've got ground cover. You're not, if you get a hard rain, you're not going to lose all your topsoil. Weed suppression, you know, you've got a dense cover there. Weeds can't uh, pop up through there. Also, it's going to help break those weed cycles, too. And the last one, uh, the big one for us down here is pest management. Yep. You're breaking those pest cycles like me and Jason talked about on the show last week. You're not giving those pests anything to eat when you put a cover crop out there. Unlike if you left squash and tomatoes out there all year long, you're constantly feeding that reproductive cycle of those pests. And then the last part about pest management is the biofumigation, which we'll talk about in a minute with the mustard. I can go back with ghost one more time. I'm, oh, I'm, oh, ghost is good stuff. I'm okay, so I've kind of broken this up as far as the cover crops into three categories. So we got the clovers. You we, love you some categories. I do. I, I like to categorize things. So we're going to talk about the clovers. We're going to talk about these other legume cool season cover crops. Then we got the brassicas. And then we got one that's kind of on its own. So you mentioned want to go getting rid of the cover crop. We, we get a lot of questions. People talking about how do I get rid of it, extinguish it. In general, the cool season cover crops are easier to get rid of than some of the summer uh, cover crops we have. So they're I know lower to the ground. They're lower to the ground. They don't have as much organic matter or much woody stalk. They're easier to get rid of than, say, sun hemp. Sun hemp's a good one, but it can be a little bit problematic getting rid of that huge woody stalk on it. So, you know, the, the biggest one I can think about would be rye. Would probably be the hardest one to get rid of, and it's really not that bad. Yeah, so I didn't bring, because all the bags kind of look the same except the label here. Let me, I'll put that one over on this side. So we have all these, all of our cover crops now we have on the site available in 20 pound options as well. Uh, we, we I, I can't say definitely if we've moved all completely to these bags. We've been going through a lot of cover crops. You get a good one there? Mm -hmm. And uh, so we got these nice fancy new foil bags there. Um, that we've been sending out. Let's go over clover real quick. We got three types of clover. We got the crimson, which we had uh, last year, and we got two new ones. We got the white Dutch, and we got the frosty bursim clover. So uh, the crimson clover, we'll start out with that. And the crimson clover we have is Omri inoculated. So it's pre inoculated, and um, it's a lot easier to put out because it's coated nice and round, and uh, it's just, just, easier to seed. Yeah, here's some of the seed right here. Now this particular one is pink. You're allowed to get one that's white. Sometimes they change the coloring on them. But if you've ever tried to put powdery inoculate on a clover seed, you will appreciate the fact that it's already been done for you. These things are, are pre-inoculated. The seeds are a little bit bigger because they make them, this coating on there makes the seed bigger and more rounded. More rounder. More you can rounder. plant them with a walk behind planter if that's your. Oh job. man, I have planted these things right here with our cedar, and it does a wonderful job with them. They're nice and uniform in size, and uh, you know, they some pretty decent sized seed once they get coated. Raw clover, uh, clover seed are not consistently round. Plus, they're a good bit smaller. Another thing that keeps you from doing is if you're hand strolling like I do, it keeps you from using so much seed when the seeds are a little bigger right. than that. So let's compare them real quick. We talked about the crimson. In my opinion, the crimson has the densest ground cover. It's going to do the best job at weed suppression. Uh, I would agree with that. You know, for y'all that live in the south, when you ride down the highway in the wintertime, and, or the spring, I might say, and you see those plants on the side of the road, it's like a strawberry. That's what we're talking about. That's the crimson mm -hmm. clover. So uh, of the three we carry, I think the crimson's going to give you the most dense vegetation, the most biomass. I think that's the advantage of it. And it is relatively cold tolerant. Yeah. Now the white dutch, on kind of the other side of the equation, the white dutch is the most heat tolerant one out there. And it can be, um, it can be grown 
longer into the warmer months here. So you could use it as a spring cover crop. Yeah, here. I was thinking about that. So I was thinking of the situation I'd want to use white Dutch clover, and I come up with this scenario right here. What if I had a spot that I didn't, wasn't going to plant anything on during the wintertime? I was going to let it rest some and recuperate. And I was only going to plant in the springtime something like sweet potatoes, a late spring, early summer or crop. winter squash. Man, this white Dutch clover would be ideal for that scenario. Yeah, so it's, it's heat tolerant, it's drought tolerant. Uh, up north, where way up north where they have pretty mild summers, uh, it almost grows like a perennial. And you can, it'll take close mowing. So you can mow it yeah, down pretty close. Uh -huh. and it, yeah, so it you can tolerate it. grazing and mowing. You can cut it and come again, whereas the crimson, uh, you can't do that as much. You know, I would say if it had a one drawback, I'd say it's not as good for the pollinators as the crimson or the, the other one you get mentioned here. What do you call it? Frosty bursin? Frosty bursin. Mm -hmm. I would say of the clovers that we sell, it's probably on the low end as far as being great for pollinators. I mean, it's a clover, so it's still good for pollinators, but it's not as good as the rest of them would be. The only disadvantage I can see to it. The last one here, the frosty bursine, which is one people might not be as familiar with, and there's a reason they call this frosty. Let me go over the bursium part So first. Though. So bursium, uh, as far as the research I've done and our seed supplier I've talked to, is the heaviest nitrogen fixing of the clovers. So it, it fixes considerable more nitrogen than the white dutch or the uh, crimson. The other good thing about the Bursium, this particular strain called Frosty, because uh, there's, there's several Bursium clovers out there, and uh, when I was talking to our supplier, I said, you know, this is something people are going to be growing as a cover crop throughout the fall and winter. He said, get the Frosty. It's, to it's cold tolerant down to single digits. Wow. That's good stuff here. So that, that means a, a good proportion of the country can yep. actually grow this one, uh, whereas other ones might winter kill a little easier. This one there is going to stay there and stay and hardy. There again, it can withstand mowings or grazing. Right. Yeah, it's a multi-cut one. You can uh, you can cut it or turn some chicken loose on it or whatever you want to do. So those are the clovers. Clovers are one of the prettiest ones in my opinion. They are. It's beautiful. Let's talk about these other legumes we have. Uh, we'll go through a couple that we've had and then talk about these new ones. So the first one is the Austrian winter pea. And you can grow Austrian winter pea by itself, but I think it really works good in a cocktail. And uh, I, I did it with vetch and radish last year. The, the radish does outcompete it a little bit at the beginning. I think the pea and the vetch combination is a really, really good one. Yeah, I have some seeds here. It's about the size of an English pea. And here again, you can plant these with our cedar. It works great with the cedar. <coughs> Excuse me, if you want to. Woo! <coughs> mm -mm. Uh, you can plant it with the cedar because it's a nice uniform round seed there. And these things just work wonderful. They stand a good bit of cold. They can stand the cold. They're going to fix a good bit of nitrogen compared to other cover crops. Um, they work really good for grazing. Your animals, your livestock are going to love them. Um, and they give you a really good ground cover. Yeah, and I'm going to tell you the way I plant them. I, I have planted them with the cedar. A lot of times I just go out there and broadcast them. Normally what you want to do when you plant these cover crops is you want to plant them twice as deep as the thickness of the seed. Or let me put it, let me rephrase that and word it another way. You want to plant it just as deep as the thickness of that seed is. In a garden situation where you got water available to it, you can get by with that. Now, out in a deer plot or somewhere like that that you ain't got ways to you water, drill, man. you need to put them deeper than that. But in a garden situation, you want to plant them twice, well, one time as deep as what they are. If you're going to have irrigation on Yeah, so, so the bigger the seed, the deeper you can plant them. These small seeds like mustard and clovers, just get them right underneath the dirt. You'll be fine. So we talked about mixing that with the vetch. And, uh, I don't have any vetch. So you don't have any vetch over there. So the vetch is a good one. Uh, it makes some really, really long vines. It kind of vines on the ground, gives some good ground cover. Those vines can get up to 12 foot long. Yeah, vines. you know, the vetch, you know my favorite way of planting vetch. I love to pair it with uh, rye. Rye. Rye or oaks or anything like that that's a monocot that has a good straight stem. It can kind of climb up. That it. can support that vetch. I think it's a wonderful combination because you get the best of both worlds there. You get a cereal grain and then you get a legume. 
Yeah, I think the the vetch is a good one to mix with another legume or to mix with a brassica cover crop. Also, the pollinator's light vetch mm -hmm. yeah, has a nice real pur purple bloom. Purple bloom, oh yeah. All right, the, the other legume that we just added is this marvel chickpea. Hmm. And we've been selling the fire out of this. Uh, a lot of people have been asking for chickpeas. People that wanted to grow chickpeas to eat themselves might not have known that it also makes a good cover crop. You may have heard the term garbanzo bean. That's the same thing as a chickpea. You like hummus? Not really. Not really? I really like hummus. Uh, so that's what you use to make hummus is chickpeas. So you can grow these as a cover crop. You can also harvest them uh, if you want to make it. That's kind of an uppy dippy thing, hummus, ain't it? Not really. It's more it's kind of Mediterranean. I, I can honestly say, say I don't think I've ever bought any hummus. Really? You need to get with the times. Hummus is all the all the rage. We have it at tailgates, all kinds of stuff. It's good, good, good food. I good thought food. it was a snooty tooty type plant. I didn't yeah. know the regular folks ate it. No, no, I don't think so. But the marble chickpea, uh, like I said, you can harvest them if you want to. And you can eat them. It's a good one to follow any heavy feeder because it's a really good nitrogen fixer. Also has really, really deep tap roots. Anytime you have deep tap roots, you're going to get some good nutrient scavenging. Now on to the brassicas. And this is where we start talking a little bit about this process called biofumigation. Uh -huh. So you, you like eating mustard from the garden. You know, when you eat mustard, it's got a little bit of spicy tinge to it. And that spicy tinge comes from these things called glucosinolates. And when you chop those up and till them into the soil, those things convert into another molecule called isothiocyanates. We'll use some big words and, for me today. Uh, basically what happens is they get rid of a lot of your harmful nematodes or harmful soil pests. Excuse me. So we call that a biofumigant. The concept is that you want to grow as much biomass as you can. It only works if you chop it up and till it in the soil, get it in the soil quick. quick. Yep, it's get got it to in get in that quick. soil. The recommendation is around 15 minutes. Get, get it in long. There. Get, get it in long. Yep. If you got a big heavy duty tiller, you can skip the mowing part and you can just churn it in. If you don't got as big of a tiller, mow it and have somebody coming right behind you with a tiller. The ideal situation is if you have a flail mower and somebody coming behind you, right behind you with a tiller, because every time you cut that leaf, it, re it has the capability of releasing more gas. So the broadleaf mustard, we talked about that using that as a biofumigate. And the reason is, is because it serves two functions. I mean, it's a biofumigate as a cover crop, as organic matter, but also you get the benefit of eating it. The broadleaf mustard, yeah, it's good stuff. You can go out there, harvest some, and eat it. Now, let's say you want to kick it up a notch on the biofumigation part. Mm. So we got a new one called Kodiak brown mustard. Now, this is not a mustard you want to eat. No, right. I expect it to be a little on the hot side. Yeah, so the hotter you get on the mustard, and there's, there's several different levels there. I'd say the, the broadleaf is on the lighter end, this Kodiak is on the far end. The, the better the biofumigation is going to be. The spicier the mustard, the better it's going to work as a biofumigant. So we've got this Kodiak brown mustard that you wouldn't want to eat, but it's going to be a lot more powerful as a biofumigant. So if you got some real hardcore nematode problems or other, you know, bad <coughs> soil pest problems, that's going to do the trick. Also, for you folks out there that have a problem with deer, you have trouble growing cover crops because deer just love them. This would be the one for you, I think. Yeah, I don't. Know. I don't think they would well, bother we're this. We're going to talk about that in a question coming up, so we, let's not give that away. Mm -mm. Okay, a so little we, head of you there, wasn't it? So we we covered the two mustards. Now we got two of these, what we call forage crops, and we got two of them. We got this African forage cabbage, and we got these impact forage collards. Okay, let me go over. Both of these are really good cover crops. They got real deep roots. They're going to do a lot of nutrient scavenging for you. But they also are great for growing if you're going to turn in some chickens, maybe even some hogs, some goats, whatever. If you're going to kind of incorporate that into your garden so those animals can uh, feed on those cover crops and feed your soils and kind of have a nice little natural system there. So these cabbage and collars that we're using for cover crops that we're speaking of have a seed size that's real similar to this mustard right here, which is a very small seed. So you could seed them with the cedar again also, or you could broadcast them. 
Just be careful if you broadcast them. Try not to get them too thick. So the African forage cabbage uh, is, is not like a traditional head cabbage. It's an open leaf cabbage and uh, has really deep tap roots. This one is one that a lot of people recommend mixing with other things. They say it works really good if you mix it with tillage radish uh, because that's also a good nutrient scavenger. Uh, so we've got the African forage cabbage and, and all these forage ones can tolerate a good bit of traffic in there and as long as you didn't just leave hogs in there for four weeks, uh, they, they should kind of grow back, maintain the root structure. The other one is these impact forage collards. And I don't think these are collards that you necessarily want to eat, um, but your animals would love to eat them. And, and supposedly these forage collards have some of the highest nutrient value for a forage crop out there. And they're extremely cold tolerant, down to zero. So our friends up north could grow these without any worry. Yeah, I don't know how far north you got to go to get in a zero degree. You got to get away. I ain't never been in those zero you, degrees. You got, yeah, you got to get above here. Where you I don't think I've been to zero. I've been close to it. I was up in Virginia one time and got pretty cold. I've been in single digits, by like seven or so. I ain't never been down zero. I've been to that here, but yeah. yeah. Um, I was in Germany. I might have got down to that in Germany. Anyway, that's cold. That's too cold for me. Yeah. Too cold for me. So you got the impact collards there, gonna give you a lot of biomass on those. Uh, great little cover crop. I would say if you got chickens. Well, oh, that big, yeah, that would be a good You got chicken. chickens, that cabbage, or that collard, or you can mix them together, uh, would be a perfect one. I might even throw in, do the cabbage, the collards, and throw in a little tillage radish, uh, and just have a little boom, boom, pal there. That there ghost pepper, pepper jelly pairs well with the cheese. Which cheese you like better, the Manchego? I like, I like both of them. I just love cheese, but it pairs well with cheese. Yeah, it's, it's going good. But I've noticed if you get one of them flakes in there, you better hold your breath because it's fishing up. Boom, boom. That's where the, well, that's where the power is. That's where the is. good is at, ain't it? The last brassica one is one we've talked about a ton, which is the tillage radish. And this is a, works wonders if you have hard or compacted soils. But even in our sandy soils, we found it to be very beneficial as a nutrient scavenger. We don't this is one I plant every year. And also, you can eat these radishes. These are the daikon breed of radishes that you'll see in the grocery store. So you can, yeah, eat, dollar for them you can eat these as well. But every year, I'm going to plant at least one of my spots in daikon radishes. And the reason is, is it does such a great job breaking my subsoil up and they're so easy to get rid of. You till these things one time and they decompose real rapidly. Yep, they break down fast. They're good for any soil type. I like to uh, I like to mix them with something. I don't like to grow them just by themselves. I like to combine them with something because what will happen, uh, from my experience, th they'll outpace about any of these cover crops. They're, they're the, one of the fastest to get up and go. And what will happen though is Shores of the world coming into November, early December, we'll get a freeze, and the freeze will knock back the foliage on these. Now, it doesn't necessarily seem to affect, or at least the freezes we get, it doesn't make the uh, radishes themselves turn into jello like it will if you get a real hard freeze. So once that freeze kind of zaps back that radish vegetation, then your other ones in the cocktail can kind of take, take over, over yeah. and it, it just works really well as a kind of succession within a plot. Mm -hmm. Now last one there's winter rye. Winter rye, which, which is, is primarily used for forage. However, it does a great job for plant for a cover crop. It's easy to put out there. Now of all the ones that we sell, this is one that I would not recommend planting with our cedar. It's a very oblong seed and it doesn't lend itself well to a vegetable cedar. Now, you, a lot of people use drills with these and that work fine, but you don't want to try to seed these. You want to broadcast this out and rake it in, hair it in very lightly, and it'll work good. It, it's easy to get up. My opinion, that one germinates better in real cold temps than any of them. I planted some uh, last year in the middle of December uh, after it then got fairly cool. It germinates really good in cool soil, so you can wait a little while on that one. Uh, it also makes a really dense kind of mat slash network of vegetation. That's really good for weed suppression. The one downside of that, in my opinion, 
This one is the toughest to get rid of. I wouldn't Thank grow you, this in a raised bed situation or uh, a situation you really got to have a harrow or a tiller to get this kind of incorporated into the soil. And it's going to usually take more than one pass. Yeah, but this, and I'm going to touch on this in just a second. If you've got a soil that you've had problems with disease in the soil, this is a great one to grow to kind of cleanse that soil up a little bit. These rise have attributes to them so that they can, you know, have activity on the soils and they cleanse the soil of disease pathogens. Yeah. So and I know everybody's going to ask, when should you be planting these cool season cover crops? We maybe should have covered that at the beginning. Our ideal time we try to plant is, for me, is anywhere, you know, early October to middle of October. But I have planted later than that, been fine. The winter rye, like I said, you've got plenty of leeway there. I tell people as far as cool season stuff goes, cover crops, aim for about a month and a half or so before your average first frost date. A month and a half to two months before your average first frost date. Um, that's going to give it plenty of time to kind of get up and going. Those first few light freezes probably ain't going to, they're not going to hurt any of these. Now you start getting in the teens, it might zap some of them, but not that, you know, we got the frosty, which is really cold tolerant, or them ca the collars which are really cold tolerant. So. so as I mentioned before, these cover crops have got to do something for you. And I made a little quick reference guide here. And I'm going to go over real quick so you give you an idea of what strategy you may want to implement with cover crops. So corn, if you had corn on spot, you want to follow it with a legume such as clover, vetch, chickpea or Australian pea, or which is not a legume, you could also use it to African forage cabbage and that's going to scavenge and save some of those nutrients for you. So those behind corn, if you're interested in pollinators and being really kind to your pollinators, you want to plant one of the clovers or a veg. If you have some real tight clay soils, daikon, radish, you got to do that. It's a no-brainer there. Okra, if you're facing some nematode problems, we always have problems with nematodes on okra. okra. Yeah, any of those. You can go behind those with those mustards. That Kodiak brown is going to be your best one there. If you want to eat it, you can plant the, the regular broadleaf. But think mustards behind where you had nematode problems. If you need to clean up an area, let's say you did have some, some nightshades or some peppers that you grown in the area, and you had some blot problems or you had a lot of disease in there, that rise we talked about would be a great one to clean that up. To improve your organic matter in your soil, that impact forage collards would be a great one. We're always concerned about increasing or putting organic matter back in the soil, and I think that collards ones that's going to make it down to zero degrees is going to be a no-brainer there. Just simply because the amount of biomass mm -hmm. it's going to produce. I mean, collards make big old thick leaves. Right. There's no bad decisions being made there, but that just gives you a guide of why you want to plant one behind a particular crop. And everybody's situation is different. Some yeah. people may have something to forage, come in there and forage. Some people may not. Some people, you know, have different ways. Just my little bit of offer there. I think that was a very good, very well, good analysis. Thank, thank you so much. We got some questions from last week's show. And uh, if we answer your question on the show, send us an email to cussserve at hostels.com with your address, and we'll send you a nice little prize. First one's from John Mendez, and he says, Thanks for covering these topics. Question regarding cover crops. Do you know of a cover crop that deer won't eat or one that will repel deer? That is a good question. And like we mentioned earlier, I think the only... And I haven't proven this, but I think the only one we got that deer might not eat is that Kodiak brown mustard. The rest of them is going to be deer heaven. They're yeah. going to love it. Now, yeah. you can look at that one of two ways. You can use that to your advantage and fill up your freezer if you want to. Or if you're just living somewhere where they won't let you harvest the deer or they're just getting on your nerves and you can't get out there and kill them, uh, I'd say the Kodiak brown mustard would probably be the least appetizing of all the cover crops. Yeah, another way to look at it is plant one that maybe can withstand some grazing. Right. Now, these peas are not going to withstand grazing. Once they gnaw them back to the ground, it's over with. They're not going to come back. But some of these, if you know you're going to have a bad deer problem, some of these clovers or things like that can withstand that, that, that grazing and then bounce back would be a good uh, strategy. Maybe like the frosty or maybe some of the forage cabbage yep. or collards. All right, number two. For Greg, it's from Greg, or B. 
And he says, hey, I'm trying to grow cabbage for the first time this year, and something is eating them alive. Mm -mm. And um, that's what we used to always say when we'd be on the creek fishing and skeeters get bad. Eat me alive. He said, what's the best product to use for pest control, keeping as organic as possible on his cabbage? Well, you can start your spray program, and we've been over this several times, of uh, neem oil, spinosad, and BT. Alternate them, and that will cover a lot of your pests and keep them pretty clean. There's also something else, and we actually don't sell these. We may in the future, but these row covers work real good for keeping flea beetles and worms and moths off your greens this time of the year. I'm becoming. I got. See if you use them from the get go. Now yeah, you let them start laying eggs on there. You do. You got to use them, and you got to use them correctly. And I'm going to do some testing on this later on this year. Hmm. But I'm beginning to think row covers have a place in the garden. Hmm. Huh. Uh, uh, I'd be interested to see how you like it. I, I'm not sold that it's worth the time. Uh, it's, a, it's going to be on a small scale. I do know that. It has to be on a small scale. Yeah. For, for me, a good rotation of spinosad and BT uh, never fails me, especially in the cool season. But uh, I'd be interested to see the... Uh, the flea beetles, the, the, the biggest reason I would use it would be one of them would be flea beetle control. All right, and next question comes from James Garrett, and it's for Travis. He said, how do you get rid of squirrels? They are all they are all my, on my broccoli and cabbage. We had a typo there, but they are all on my broccoli and cabbage. We'll forgive James for his yeah. typo. It's all right. It's okay, James. So this is this is the way I, I, I recommend getting rid of squirrels. <clears throat> and some people will use a rifle, but I, 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 I like... I ain't the best shot in the world, and I like to make sure I do the trick. So get you a 12 gauge or a 20 gauge, and you can't go out there with the intention of you going to kill a squirrel in the first two minutes because they, they they are a little bit leery. So what you got to do is you got to kind of get, get them acclimated to you. So you just keep your shotgun out there by the garden when you work in the garden. You just kind of sit there and look at them squirrels and watch them for a little bit, and uh, you'll catch them slipping. They got a pretty short memory. When you catch them slipping, you lay them down, lay one or two of them down, get you a good sharp knife and you skin them up. Skin them up, cut them up, get you a cast iron skillet, get you some grease hot, and you're going to put them in some flour, just like you would fry chicken. You know, fry up them legs uh, on that squirrel there. And uh, when you get done frying it, make you a little bit of brown gravy, and you get your bag of them frozen biscuits, the ones you got to cook beside each other. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Get some gravy, your fried squirrel, your biscuits, and go out there and sit out your garden and eat that in front of them other squirrels out there. And let them know what's happening. And let them know what could happen to them how it was you to get hungry again or get upset about your cabbage. Now, each to their own, but I'll take fried squirrel any day where I would fried rabbit. Squirrel has always been fried, my favorite. If you're going to fry it, yeah, I like, I like squirrel better than rabbit. I like rabbit done a little different in, in the crock pot with Well, most of the time they're a little older and they're a little tougher. And you have to cook them a little bit longer. Depends on what kind of, you know, if it was a fox squirrel, I wouldn't eat no fox squirrel, but I eat old. Gray squirrel. Yeah, yeah. Just I, I don't really care for eating them old swamp rabbits. We've eaten a bunch of them, though, ain't we? We have, but I, I prefer cottontail. Yeah. All right. Number four is from Dave Robbins. <clears throat> he says, uh, do you have any insect pressure with a transplant you start in the greenhouse? I had a lot of people ask us, how do you handle pest pressure on the seed trays themselves. The same way you would handle them out in the garden, but we never have any problems in the greenhouse. Never had any problems in the greenhouse. I can think of maybe one time in the last four years I have sprayed the greenhouse. Maybe one time. And it's right next to the garden, so it's not like it's geographically isolated or anything. Just have never had any issues. And uh, yeah, now I would probably knock down my dosage a little bit if I was going. In oh there yeah, yeah. And them. then you wouldn't want a finer spray, something like a mist. It may be to the fact that we don't ever let them stress hardly in the uh, in the greenhouse, because you know, insects love a stressed plant. Yeah. Well, our plants are well fed, well watered in there. Uh, the other thing is, and this just just kind of pops to my mind, is what might be an explanation. If if for some reason you you don't your seed trays maybe have some egg residue on them, and you're getting some recurring pests there, uh, that could be an issue. Ours are we could, I just kind of wash ours off, but we leave them in the greenhouse where it gets hot enough to kill about anything. You definitely, if you're using the bottom trays, you don't want any standing water. Yeah. 
All right. Well, that is going to do us do it for us. Um, mm. Just just as a reminder, everybody, this is what this is what LSU's record is right now. Mm. Um, so we got the the, mm. got the Auburn Tigers coming in Athens. We did some work on we that. We did some work that last one. I got on that cracker there, like the guy. That's pretty good. We got a little, yeah. little bit left of that. that Matt. Matt King, right? Mm -hmm. Out of Thank Athens. you to Matt for sending us yeah. that. That is some fine, fine stuff right so, there. First time I've ever <laughs> eaten ghost peppers. We might have to fight over these two jars. I might, uh, one of these might end up in my camper on the camping trip. Mm -hmm. Camping trip pretty soon. Anyway, hope everybody enjoyed that show. If you got any other questions about cool season cover crops, what to plant, techniques, any of that, put those in the comments below. And it's time, folks, time to be getting serious about those cover crops. If you enjoyed the show, don't forget to give us a big thumbs up, hit that subscribe button, hit that bell button so you get notified every time we come out with a new video. And if you did enjoy tonight's show, we got two videos right here showing some in the field, cool season cover crop stuff. I think you'll really enjoy those as well. We'll see you next time. Take care.